Um, all right, I need that and this one. Okay. okay. So, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to visit your wonderful, beautiful island. Thank you. Um, and I was extremely impressed by all of the questions and answers. Some of the questions were quite remarkable. Um, some of the answers, most of the answers, were extremely thoughtful. So, congratulations. <laughs> okay. Yes, quite right. Um, <laughs> and to the teachers for having uh, brought up and brought such a wonderful group of students. Now, I'm going to uh, look now at a little bit at calculus. I understood from the first uh, question this morning that a few of you had calculus, but certainly not all of you. Is that right? Let's start by, can I actually ask you, since you're in active mode, I have seen, um, who has had calculus here? Few people, yes, some people. Now, the rest of you, the, the ones who didn't put your hands up, are you planning to take calculus? Yes. yes. Okay. So the first part of the, the talk is who has taken calculus? What I want you to think about is why is calculus such an important subject? Mostly when you're in school, they say, okay, this is the next thing you're going to learn, and you learn it, and you often don't have time to think about why is it that I'm learning this as opposed to that or something. So, guys, why is calculus a part of your life? I understand your teachers told you to, or your parents told you to, or the school told you to, but why? Anybody got any thoughts here? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. There's an honest lady in the middle. <laughs> okay. So, part of what I want to say here is to give you a sense of why it is that calculus has become an important part of, in fact, the curriculum of mathematics, essentially everywhere in the world. There's a reason for it. You saw the two people who created it earlier this morning, Leibniz and Newton, and um, Graciela is quite right. There was nearly a huge to-do about it because the English, being the English, of course, thought they had done it first, and the Europeans, being the Europeans, thought they had done it first. And, in fact, they were simultaneous, I believe. Um, so the question is, what makes it useful? Uh, there's lots of actual answers. I'm going to focus on one piece, which, for those of you who do anything in science, whether it's a natural science, like chemistry or medicine or biology or whatever, um, or a social science, like economics, you're quite likely to know about rates of change. So, um, for those of you who've had calculus, you need to be uh, asleep for a minute so that I can make sure the other people can read the notation. Um, so here, and I'm, let me just be clear here. I am actually English, but I am using Leibniz's notation here. So this is an international friendship operation for calculus. Okay. okay. Um, supposing P is population. For example, it's the population of Guam, which changes with time. T is time. Deep, this expression, which looks like a fraction, but actually it's not a fraction, but for the, that's, you can discuss that with your teachers later in life. This thing, small d p over d t, I want you to think about for this morning as the rate at which p is changing with time. You may think, OK, I had rates one other time in my life. It was an algebra. This is different because it varies from time to time. It's not a constant. Okay, that's a subject which we will deal with later in, later in your lives. You might think about it. How do I know, um, or how would I um, figure out how much the population of Guam was, was increasing each year? Well, you might, look you might go and look in the public records now, and you might look a year ago. You would say, oh, it's increased by so many thousand, and that's the rate of change. And that would be represented by dpdt. The official mathematical calculus name is derivative, but 
you can think of derivative as a rate of change and it will give you the right uh, idea and it will show you how to think about the application. So far, are you okay? People who've never seen this before, are you still alive? <laughs> <laughs> think of it as a rate. Okay, let's just practice for a second. Um, so, um, if H is your height, you are changing with time, probably, or at least you certainly were. You may have stopped, but probably you are. Uh, what's the HDT mean? I'm looking, I'm not asking for a number, I'm asking for a, 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 ver, a, a, a verbal answer, in words. Math major is no fair. Okay. <laughs> um, other people from the schools, how, what is the HDT telling you? Be brave. I understood the vice president before she left told me that the, tr the students in Guam talked. So I'm expecting her to be right. <laughs> <laughs> Have a go. H is height, T is time, so DH DT means? Yes. Oh, sorry? How your height is changing with time, the rate of change of your height with time? Give the man a hand, he's right. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's how your height is changing with time, it's how fast you're growing, which is the same thing. Quite right. Other people, could you have said that if you've been a little braver? <laughs> okay, next time be a little braver. Okay, um, so let's look at the second one. Um, if X is how far the ca a car is from you, what's the X dt? Ah, yes, Kevin. I even know your name. <laughs> it's the velocity. Yes, because it's how quickly the position is changing, right? <coughs> Quite right. Thank you. Give him a hand, too. <laughs> Good for you. Okay, so we've had one from the middle of the room, one from that side of the room. You guys over there, this one's yours. Um, what about dv dt? What does it mean? V is the volume of water in your swimming pool, in somebody's swimming pool. Could you make a statement about dv dt? <laughs> you <laughs> you <laughs> Are you encouraging him, or are you going to push him off the chair if he doesn't answer? <laughs> yes, quite right, Joseph. Congratulations. The rate of change of the w volume of the water. That's right. Give him a hand. Thank you very much, and thank you for your assisting role. Okay, yes, it's the rate that the water is um, flowing in or flowing out of the swimming pool. Okay. I'm going to stop asking you questions, you'll be glad. So now I want to look at how this is used. We're going to look at two examples, um, which are both real examples, um, which are, I think, one of the, re the kinds of reasons why it's important to know calculus, whether or not you become a mathematician in your lives or whether you become some other person in the world, you can do a lot with calculus. You know, the, um, the <coughs> vice president explains that you could solve murders. I was having a different idea here. Um, and so the first question is looking at how the economy runs. This may not make an enormous amount of difference in the right now, but if your parents don't have a good income and so on, it can make a huge difference, and you know, sooner or later you'll have your own income. And then the second question was, um, when SARS, the, the, the disease, went to, uh, uh, came out, it happened in Asia in 2003, a lot of us in the world escaped, including you. Um, and you might be surprised, but mathematics has quite a lot to do with it. 
Let's look at it first. The first thing I want to do is do the economic, look at the economic example. Here is a map of the world, which you, can, you don't need to see much detail. What this shows you, and I was worried to see, and I'm sure that you are, have this experience often, Guam seems to be rather hard to find on this map. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, I didn't draw it. <laughs> Um, and I'm afraid this probably isn't the first time that happened to you. Here's the, here's the thing. Uh, this is what this map is showing. The green is the US. If we could see Guam, she would be a green blob. Okay. Um, the countries that are blue, of which there are very few, have a higher income per capita than the US. So there's just a few of them, it's uh, Norway and Sweden, Denmark, and there are some tiny European countries which are smaller than Guam, Luxembourg, there are a few places that are extremely small. Um, so these countries are actually, the, the people in them are on average better off than we are, but there are not many. <coughs> the rest of the world, the orange part, is less well off than we are. So one of the things you see quickly is, although you may feel you don't have enough money, um, there are a lot more people in the world who have a lot less money. Okay. So I want to think about how this is going to keep going. Here's another question. This is a picture, I mean graph, of the income per person. It's actually what's called the GDP per capita, the gross domestic product per capita. Anyway, it means basically the money per person. And I want you, I don't know, you probably have not thought about these things a whole lot if you're in school, but let's start now. This graph goes back to, Lord knows when, uh, 1929, yeah, 19, yeah, it's a long time ago. <laughs> and what I want you to notice first is there's a general trend which is kind of obvious, right? It's going up. You may notice at the top there is a little blip. If you go at the very top right corner, that's actually the recent past. There's been, I don't know if this is familiar or not familiar, there's been a, a brief recession. This is pretty bad. And those of you who have relatives or parents who lost jobs, it's awful. So that's the the recession is represented by that drop. There were a lot of people who lost money in the last two or three years. But on average, the economy has grown. Why is this important? Well, mostly it goes upwards. But if the economy is shrinking, which it did a little bit in the last few years, it's a major disaster. People lose their jobs, people can't feed their children, people can't go to school, it's a big issue. And in particular, if the economy is not growing, we say it's stagnant and that's not good either. So the thing I want to think about is how, what does it take to keep the economy expanding? Now, there are more people in the, in the world every year and if the economy is going to expand, one has to have more oil or energy of some sort because, you know, there are more people, they eat more, they drive more cars, they, uh, you know, have to keep cool if you're here or warm if you're in Boston or whatever. So there's a big question which you may never have thought about, and if we're lucky we won't have to think about, but I fear we may, which is the question about when will the oil supply start to decrease? There is only, no matter how much oil there is in the world, there is only a finite amount of oil in the world. You agree? So, here's a little story. Um, about uh, six years ago, in 56, this guy, who was a geologist, he gave a paper, he did, gave a talk in San Antonio, and he said something that at the time was very surprising. So here is his prediction. And he, he made his predictions using calculus that those of you who take calculus, which I think is either has, you all have done or all will do, 
The first year, of, you can do what he did using the first year of calculus. Um, he said in 1956 that the oil would peak, so the maximum would occur, in somewhere between 1965 and 70. That, you notice, is in the past. So the question was, was he right? Okay. Um, now, the students here are not going to remember this personally. Your parents and teachers might. Um, here are pictures. In 1970, there was actually the first uh, an oil crisis. He, these are photographs of it. What happened? So were, the gas stations were either closed and didn't sell oil at all, uh, or sell gas at all, or they sold only a limited amount. And here at the bottom is New York City with the cars all lining up for hours on end waiting for gas. It was a huge mess. It wasn't just the peak in the oil. There was also political crises. There's lots of things. But it was a big mess. Say, so, wait a minute, but it went away. We, this isn't happening now. If I drive out now, I can get oil. I can get gas. What's going on? So what happened? Think about it. What, did it. what do you think did happen? There was this big crisis. There was not enough gas. People were furious, by the way. <laughs> Let's look at, this pa look at this picture. Can you see this? There's a... Um, this, gra this one is U.S. oil. This one is imported oil. Up until 19, just before 1970, most uh, gasoline in the U.S. came from the U.S. Very little piece was imported. What has happened since then? So what happened then was people said, oh my god, we need more oil. So they started buying it from other countries. Perfectly reasonable. So the switch to foreign oil happened around, uh, the, gradually, but a lot, it was, uh, move, the move to foreign oil has moved a lot after 1970. At this point, we are using two-thirds foreign oil. Now just think, think ahead to the math of this. What are we going to do when the world's oil peaks? We can't move to the moon. <laughs> right. So next time, there won't be a solution that's quite as simple. We can move to different uh, times, kinds of energy. We can move to wind or sun or whatever. So I don't think anybody's made a, you know, it's not easy to make a solar car yet. But anyway, perhaps you'll invent one. So the next question is going to be, and I will leave this one for you to do for homework or whatever, is when is the world oil going to peak? I cut the x-axis off so you can't see. <laughs> So the question is, where is this? What year? Are you all going to be alive? I will show you the answer. So actually, uh, during this, some of you, yes. Um, <laughs> there's a squeak in the front row. <laughs> You're noticing the dates, right? Yes. Yes, OK. The predictions are somewhere in the next few years. Some of you might still be in high school. <laughs> now, whether this is a disaster or not a disaster depends a lot on what kind of energy we use and whether or not you guys are effective, efficient, and good at figuring out how to make things work effectively. There's a lot to be done. I want to pay tribute just a little bit. To the, this is the guy who did, who, who did the first thing. When he did this, he was incredibly unpopular because the US may, got all their own oil. They, all the, pretty much all the gas came from here. And he was the one who looked at the numbers. He looked at the math and said, this isn't going to go on beyond 1965-70. Uh, he just looked at the numbers, and he was brave enough and crazy enough both, to say what he saw. 
That's the first piece. Okay, so now I'm going to look at the second piece, which is the SARS. Because this is another place where I think it's roughly true that the fact that certain officials in Asia did their math right is the reason why we didn't get the disease. Let me explain. I don't know, um, so here's the background if you weren't part of this or don't remember. Um, SARS is a, was a very bad kind of flu, but it was really awful because it killed a fair number of the people that got it. It wasn't just flu, it was horrible flu. And it was extremely infectious, and there were pretty bad outbreaks in China, Hong Kong, Singapore, Vietnam. There were a few cases in mainland US, mainland um, Canada. There were a few cases in Europe, but a tiny number. Um, there was a period of about two months when I think most of us thought that the disease was going to sweep around the world in a great wave and that we were all going to get it, or large numbers. We didn't. And so I hope that one day some of you will be the people who figure this stuff out. So here's, the here's a little bit of the background. Um, map of China with how many cases, red is a lot of cases. You notice the bottom picture uh, is all the police and the officials, everybody's wearing gas masks. Um, I mean, not gas masks, you know, face masks, so they didn't breathe. People were terrified. Um, I had a student at the time who was a Chinese um, uh, newspaper writer, and he, somebody in his office got SARS. He was okay. But he had a small boy that he, you know, treasured enormously. And he spent more than a month. Uh, he didn't want to see his child because he was afraid that he, if he got sick, he would infect him. And so the mom and the little boy lived in the front room of the apartment. And he lived in the kitchen. And he came, he climbed up the back, uh, black wall and into the kitchen window. So he didn't see his son for a month and didn't make him sick. People were terrified. What did they do? Now, I don't know if you've seen any of these pictures. Um, the top is a street clinic, and the person sitting down and the person standing up in the white clothes, they're stopping passers-by and making them take their temperature, and if they looked a little bit sick, talking to them about where they'd been, and if they were sick at all or knew anybody who'd been sick, they were taking them to quarantine. In the bottom picture is, an, I think it's a nurse, who's in quarantine, she's shut up in a hospital, or it actually I think they used a lot of schools, and nobody was allowed to talk to her for a month. The stuff on the window is her food. So they brought food to her, but nobody was allowed to go in or talk to her anything. They were really strict. There was a guy in Singapore who was quarantined. He wasn't allowed out of his house, and he got bored after like, a, I don't know, three weeks, and he went out for a beer, and they plunked him in jail. So they were really fierce. They say, oh, how awful. They may have saved our lives by doing this. Now, we'll look at the math in a sec. Um, Hong Kong had one very bad apartment block. This is Hong Kong. And um, here's the TV news writer, still wearing a gas mask. Um, they're taking everybody off to uh, a quarantine place. Look at the little boy who's completely terrified. Um, and the bottom is the medical crew evacuating people in that bus. So it was a pretty brutal time. How could they do that? OK, well, how, the, the brutalness was this quarantine. And so what, I, what we're going to look at math-wise for a, just a minute or two is how do we know the quarantine was going to work? So now imagine yourself 20 years in the future. And let's suppose that it's Guam and not Hong Kong. I actually did this with the real data from Hong Kong, so you can see it worked. But you know, in the future, it might be here, and it might be you. You're working for the island. There's some disease like SARS. It won't be the last time. That's come to some nearby place, to some place that people come here from, maybe mainland US, maybe Hawaii, maybe Philippines, maybe somewhere Asia, somewhere. And some of the officials say to you, so what should we do? There 
are several possibilities, but one possibility is to just close it down. Think about it, you could shut the airport, you could shut the docks, you could say nobody is coming or going to a bar. Now you're, I know, I, I know what controversy there is about the r rules for bringing things to, the, to Guam, the political issue I know. But uh, most of what you have, or many things you have, come from somewhere else. So if you shut the docks down, there's no food, there's no this, there's no that, it's pretty grim. The economy falls apart quite quickly. But if you just shut the airport and you don't shut the docks, then you know, a sick person can come on the boat. So you have a very awful choice. Either I shut things down and there's a really grim choice and the economy falls apart, or I have a quarantine progr uh, program like China and Hong Kong and I yank everybody off the street and say, your sister has a disease, you're going off to this hospital and I'm looking you up. Thank you. It's a grim choice. Let's look at the math. Okay. So now you're doing a real piece of math for a minute. Then we're going to give you prizes, so cheer up. <laughs> okay, so there's a, there's a model called the SIR model. This is a real thing. I'm, I'm, this is not a made-up story. This is the real math. S stands for susceptible, who are actually the people who are well. So that you have to think, this is, uh, uh, S stands for the susceptible, who are people who are currently well and could get sick. The I are the infected people, so those are the sick people, and the R is the removed people. They have either recovered, or they have died, or they have been plunked in some quarantine program. So those are how you get, that's how you become R. And remember those derivatives that you managed a few miles ago? I want to think about DSDT. That's the rate at which well people are getting sick. Um, this is the rate at which sick people are removed. They can get removed by recovering, dying, or quarantine. And they also, I should add to this, they also um, can be increased by the people who are getting sick. So it's actually the net of the people getting sick minus the people who are removed. One can show, uh, not at this minute, but um, we can, one can show I'm not going to do this here, but th there are some equations that relate these derivatives. This is called a set of differential equations, and it's something that you can certainly do in first-year calculus. One of the other things you do in set calculus is learn how to solve these things. Again, I'm skipping that stage. <laughs> it's Saturday. Here is what happens in... It, what happened, this is truly what happened in Hong Kong. If Hong Kong had had no quarantine, so imagine your, what I'm going to do is say, what would have happened if Hong Kong didn't have a quarantine? What would happen if Hong Kong did have a quarantine? If they did not have quarantine, this is what would have happened. Now this is the weird, this is, just to be clear, this is the weirdest graph you've probably ever seen. This is true for all of you. Because um, it's what's called in uh, differential equations, it's called a phase plane. But these people down here, the susceptibles, these are the number of well people. The vertical is the number of sick people. Okay. Bizarre. Um, and it, it works like this. That big blob is 6.8. That's the population of Hong Kong when we started. At the very beginning, they were basically all well. The, when, the, when the World Health Organization started counting, there were 95 sick people. So this point represents when the situation got serious. 95 sick people, they were sitting in hospital in Hong Kong, and 6.8 million who were basically, who were fine. The model predicts this. Look at the arrow. That tells you which way time goes. So this, think of this like a movie. What is happening here? More and more and more sick people. How many sick people here? 
300,000. It's 0.3 times 10 to the 6, it's 300,000. It's a big number, whatever. It's certainly bigger than the number of beds in Hong Kong's hospitals. Um, so, colossal epidemic. That says actually that this piece represents the number of people that wouldn't have got sick. This model suggests or, or um, predicts that if Hong Kong hadn't had a um, quarantine policy, about half their population would have gotten sick. This is a total disaster. Here's another picture with quarantine say, wait a sec, the graph went away. What happened? <laughs> what happened actually, and this is, Hong Kong did their mathematics right, as did Beijing. Um, the start is about here. That's the 6.8 and the 95. And so, in fact, here, the thing died out almost as quickly as it started. What actually happened in Hong Kong was uh, in mid-March, they had 95 people who were sick. And there was panic, panic, panic. It was, for those who were in the countries at the time, it was terrifying, terrifying. But they had a very severe quarantine policy. And by June, the epidemic was over. 1,555 people had gotten sick, which is a lot smaller than 300,000. So you can show using the math that if, so when you come to Guam, which in your lifetimes I hope you never do, but we might all might. When you come to Guam, if you have nobody in the island who is sick already, nobody, that's a bit hard to determine. There's always somebody's grandmother or this or that. If there's nobody in the island who's sick, and if you shut every single way of getting into the island, you might avoid it. That's mighty hard. There's the military. There's all those food ships coming in and this and that. And there are the grandmothers and grandfathers and those of you who want to go to college and this and that. It's just hard to do in this world. So unless you can shut the place off entirely, having, shutting the port, shutting the airport, delays the start of the epidemic but doesn't prevent it. The only thing that cuts it is, uh, you can do the more details of this in math, in your calculus classes, the thing that cuts it down is having a core, is removing people from circulation quickly so that they don't make other people sick. That's why quarantine works, because although you shut them up in those hospitals outside Beijing and didn't let them talk to anybody, it was very mean, it prevented those people from making somebody else sick. And the result is that you don't get an epidemic, which I think that we can thank calculus and the officials in Asia for us not getting the disease. So I want to say, I will hope you all learn calculus very well because it can make a huge difference to the lives of people all over the world. And in fact, we may, are, we may at this moment owe our lives to calculus. Thank you. <laughs>Do you have questions or perhaps you want prizes? <laughs> but I am happy to ask questions now or after the prizes. Yeah, do you have any questions? Yeah, this is, this is her last talk. You know, she actually gave a talk uh, Thursday, Friday, then uh, she's off after that. So, you know, so if you have any questions, please. And I'm happy to talk at the end as well, so it doesn't have to be now. I think we should give them prizes. Okay, so uh, let's give a hand again. Thank you very much.